Hi, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? How are you? Ah, oh, that's good. Okay. Beautiful day out. It's cool out. Feels great. It's wonderful to see everybody here. So, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kurt Landgraf. I'm the president of the college. And it's great to see you. Dr. Rands, how are you, sir? It's a pleasure to see all of you here. Welcome to the annual celebration of the George Washington Prize, honoring Kevin Hayes. He's the winner of the 2018 prize for his work, George Washington, A Life in Books. It is truly a pleasure to see all of you here celebrating this wonderful Washington College tradition and honoring one of the nation's largest literary prizes. It's awarded annually for the year's best work about America's founding era. The prize honors well-written books that contribute to a broad understanding of American history. And also, it tries to bring to light new or overlooked stories about our past. This George Washington Prize was established in 2005 at the college's Star Center. You'll hear from uh, Dr. Goodhart soon. Uh, for the study, it's the Star Center for the Study of American Experience in partnerships with the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and, of course, George Washington's Mount Vernon. Now, few Americans think of the nation's founding father as a writer or avid reader. In George Washington, A Life in Books, Mr. Hayes presents an intellectual biography of Washington. Scholars have long known that Mount Vernon housed an impressive library of more than 1,300 volumes. By examining closely the Washington books, his reading notes and journals, Mr. Hayes has uncovered an intellectual curiosity that dozens of previous biographers have missed. As a young man, Washington read popular serials such as Gentleman's Magazine and The Spectator, which helps to bridge the long imagined gap between him and his learned contemporaries like Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams. A panel of six distinguished scholars in the field selected Hayes' book and six others as finalists for the prize. The winner was picked by a committee of judges from each of the three co-sponsors. The prize was officially awarded to Mr. Hayes last May at a gala dinner in Mount Vernon. It's now my honor to welcome Kevin and his wife, Suki, to Washington College and to Chestertown. I now would like to introduce Adam Goodhart, the Hodgson Trust Griswold Director of the Star Center, who will introduce Kevin Hayes. Adam. Thank you, Kurt, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Kevin Hayes and his award-winning work, and I'm especially proud of this year's Washington Prize book because its recipient began the project back in 2008 with a fellowship from the Star Center to study the collection of Washington's books at the Boston Athenaeum. So we've really been there um, with him from the beginning to the end, and we're really proud to have played a role in that. Dr. Hayes' book is full of enlightening moments, but one of my favorites is a story about George in his teenage years that was handed down orally through generations and generations of the Washington family. Um, apparently, one day, a bunch of the local boys around um, the northern neck of Virginia were horsing around, wrestling each other, and this one big galoot was defeating all the other boys. Meanwhile, young George sat quietly reading a book under a nearby tree. As the bully body slammed his victims one by one into the dirt, he kept taunting George to stand up and fight. Finally, when not a single challenger was left standing, our hero calmly laid his book down on the grass, strolled over, kicked the kid's butt, and then promptly went back to his reading. Now that anecdote may or may not be apocryphal, but in any case, the moral of the story to, to me is clear, inspired by leaders like General Washington and writers like Dr. Hayes, we should all seek lives that balance action with reflection. Dr. Hayes' own career has certainly done just that. Both an avid cyclist and an emeritus professor of English at the University of Oklahoma, he has published no fewer than 38 books. 
and he only published his first book in 1991. It's incredibly daunting and, and impressive. These range from The Road to Monticello, The Life and Mind of Thomas Jefferson, which was a finalist for this very George Washington Prize in 2009, to books on Edgar Allan Poe and Herman Melville, as one as one on a distant cousin of Dr. Hayes who bicycled across the United States in 1807 on one of those funny penny farthing bikes with a gigantic front wheel. I can only imagine what it was like climbing the Rocky Mountains on the thing. Maybe you can enlighten us later. As nearly all of us at Washington College know, our college's founder received an honorary degree from this institution in 1789. But our revered patron lacked something that all of our other alumni possess, namely a college education. John Adams, as we know, was a Harvard man. Thomas Jefferson got his degree at William and Mary. And Alexander Hamilton, of course, um, went to Columbia, as all of us who saw the musical um, know. But Washington made do with just local grammar schools and a series of, of private tutors of, shall we say, varying quality. Dr. Hayes points out that in his mid-teens, at an age when many other genteel young men were polishing their Greek and Latin skills, Washington was still thumbing through a book of basic English grammar. And a few years later, instead of heading off to university, he went in the opposite direction, westward, with his surveying gear. Today, as we ponder this gaping hole in the education section of George Washington's resume, we can only let our imagination wander, just think what George Washington would have accomplished if only he'd had an undergraduate education. Well, he did pretty well nonetheless. Um, don't tell our Washington College students who we're trying to encourage to graduate in four years. Dr. Hayes and I will have a conversation about his book for about 20 or 25 minutes before opening it up to a few questions from the audience. And um, as usual, we'll give first shot to any students in the audience who want to ask questions. Um, and then you're invited to join us for a reception in the lobby, uh, I'm sorry, not the lobby, in the back, um, where books will be, um, also books will be available over here at the, at the corner table with Shannon um, for sale and signing. And as usual at Star Center events, the books will be available at half price to Washington College students with the Star Center subsidizing the remainder of that. And now, please join me in welcoming on stage the winner of the 2018 Washington Prize, Kevin Hayes. Kevin, oh, let me turn on my thing. Okay. Can you hear me now? So Kevin, you've, you've written books about um, Washington as a reader and thinker and Jefferson as a reader and thinker. Now, they were, they were two very different men. As of the end of the revolution, you, you point out that Washington had a 1,000 books in his life. I'm sorry, not even a 1,000 books. About, uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. Um, about, I'm sorry, 350 books in his library, and Jefferson had about 2,000, and Franklin had about 4,000. Um, so we don't normally think of Washington as such a huge reader, but can you compare those two, those two men? Well, I think that for both uh, Jefferson and Washington, reading was a very practical activity. Uh, one thing that they had in common is they didn't, neither of them liked to read novels very much. Uh, I mean, both Washington and Jefferson had the, the biggies, the Don Quixote and, and uh, some of the uh, Tristram Shandy, uh, the, the most important novels of the time period. But otherwise, they, they weren't interested in reading fiction. They both wanted to read practical works. Now, Jefferson had a much more uh, broad scope of his interest in uh, learning. Uh, you know, he really sought to be comprehensive in his uh, knowledge of different subjects, whereas Washington's reading was more focused. Uh, his greatest collection in his library, I think, were the agricultural books. And you could say that Washington had the greatest collection of agricultural books in colonial America. Uh, but he was also interested in reading travels and reading history. Uh, and, and so Washington and Jefferson did share many interests, but I think Jefferson's was more uh, wide-ranging in scope, whereas Washington's was more focused. But could you, could you talk about um, Washington as a son of the Enlightenment, as we think of Jefferson as a son of the Enlightenment, or was he not as affected by all those ideas coming over, those ideas from France and, uh, and, and Europe and, and the great intellectual currents of his time? 
Well, I think we can think of Washington as a as son of the Enlightenment. I mean, Jefferson uh, calls him a genius in the notes on the state of Virginia, but a genius in, in military science. Uh, now, there are some gaps in Washington's uh, knowledge, though. One of the things that kind of surprised me was that uh, there was a, a French author named Berthaud who wrote these books about the revolutions. And these are you know, revolutions of Sweden and revolutions of, of several different, different countries. Uh, and Adams read these, Washington, uh, Jefferson read these. Um, a lot of early American founding fathers uh, read the revolutions of Berthaud. But Washington didn't read it Berthaud until after the revolution. And then he, he asked the, uh, his aide de camp to, who was buying some books for him after the war and said, could you buy me a copy of this Berthaud's revolutions if you think it's worthwhile? And it just, that one just kind of surprised me because that was, that was a big gap in, in Washington's uh, knowledge. And so, I mean, I think that he did, uh, we can put him with the Enlightenment, but, but with the caveat, with the, there were some gaps in his knowledge. Can you talk about, um, just sort of back to the basics, how you did your, I mean, it was really kind of, kind of sleuthing that you, that you did, and I know it wasn't always easy because Washington didn't leave the same kind of record of his books as Thomas Jefferson, let alone you can go and visit Jefferson's libraries at Mount Vernon and, at, I'm sorry, at Monticello, of course, and uh, the Library of Congress, but um, how, do you, how do you do your investigation? Well, uh, I mean, it was a kind of a cliche that people say that Washington didn't read, that he just, uh, he just acquired books to put on his shelves. He was just a shelf filler. But uh, <laughs> I thought I would try and challenge that assumption and see if there's anything to prove that he, he wasn't, if there, if there was some way to prove that he did read his books. Now, Washington didn't write in his books uh, uh, marginalia like John Adams did. I mean, you look at John Adams' books, and you can tell. He's, every, anytime he gets mad at an author, he he's writes in the margin. Uh, <laughs> That's my John Adams imitation. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good one. <laughs> but Washington, uh, he didn't, uh, I mean, occasionally, but, but very rarely did he keep marginalia. But one thing that he did do was that he was, he was a perfectionist. And if he found a typo, he would correct it. And so what I was able to do is just to, uh, at the Boston Athenaeum and other lo uh, libraries where, that, that owned books that Washington owned, was just to... You know, page through it one by one, looking for any sort of stray pen marks, any typos that got corrected. And I was looking at Washington's copy of Gulliver's Travels at Princeton University, and sure enough, on about page 200, there was a typo that had been corrected. And I recognized it as Washington's because I'd looked, I'd seen enough other Washington typo corrections to to recognize his his handiwork. And so I could say, yes, Washington did read Gulliver's Travels. And, and so that's, that's what a lot of my work uh, was from. Now, occasionally I did find uh, some marginalia. Now, there is a copy of Defoe's Travels Through Great Britain at the Boston Athenaeum that was Washington's copy. And there's one part where Defoe mentions uh, Mandeville's Fable of the, of the Bees. But uh, Defoe just mentioned it kind of offhand in a vague way. And, and Washington wrote in the margin, Mandeville's fab uh, Fable of the Bees. And so it tells me that Washington was, uh, was familiar with that work. Now, there's no copy of it survives in his library or uh, with his evidence of his ownership. But um, he knew it. Uh, he, 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 at least he mentioned it, uh, knew, recognized Defoe's reference to it. You know, I was also I was really interested to learn about the books that Washington owned, and some of them were just sent to him. He didn't buy them himself, because as he got more and more famous, people would just mail him books all the time uh, that he may or may not have wanted. But it's interesting to know about the books that he owned, but that he clearly never read. Um, and in those days, I know the books were printed so that you had to cut open the pages before reading them. And so somebody sent him a pamphlet on slavery, and, and you found that he never even sliced open the pages? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> what does that say about him? And what does it say about his attitude towards slavery? Well, I think that that's a, that's a complex question. Now, one of the, the most interesting things that I found was that he had uh, several pamphlets about slavery that were bound up with a copy of uh, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon. Hmm. And, you know, how are we supposed to interpret that? I mean, it was... Uh, was this just a decision that his bookbinder made, or did Washington choose the, to bind all those pamphlets together? And, and, or is, if he did, if he, he saw Bentham's Panopticon as a kind of uh, 
somehow correlated to slavery. Was, was Bentham's method of, of uh, looking at all these, uh, well, I mean, basically what Bentham did was he, he devised a system of, for, for prisons that where, where you would have one person in, in the center who could see in many different directions at once and so keep an eye on, on the prisoners. And so was Washington suggesting some, something like that? And so it's a very complex uh, topic that, I mean, you really, uh, I don't think anyone had written about that before. Uh, but when you look at his copy of Bentham bound up with these copies of the slave pam uh, pamphlets on slavery, then you start thinking about it in different ways. And that was really a kind of a, an important and fraught and disturbing question for a lot of slaveholders, wasn't it? That idea of how do you surveil these people who you're keeping in prison, basically? And that idea that you, know, you turn your gaze away for a moment and something bad is going to happen, whether it's people not working or even, even uh, rebelling against slavery. And so you think that may have been in Washington's mind somewhere? Um, I think so. Now, I, I end my chapter on slavery and, and the Panopticon with, with a very hopeful, on a very hopeful note. And the, uh, this idea is that Washington, in, as, as many of you may know, is that he, he arranged to free his slaves in his will uh, after the uh, death of his wife. And he also arranged to give the, the younger ones, uh, the younger freed slaves, an education. And so I think that that's, you know, the best way to, to control the population is to give them an education and let them make decisions for themselves. I, you know, speaking of slavery, I don't think you mentioned, or at least I, maybe I missed the reference to it, one of Washington's most famous literary encounters with Phyllis Wheatley, um, the poet who, I, th I think it was 1775 when he was commander in, in chief, just commander in chief, she came and presented her poems, and, and some scholars have claimed that that was this kind of watershed moment in his understanding of African Americans and, and belief in their intellectual um, equality, and, and do you just not think that's the case, or, or, or what? Yeah, I just don't think that's, that's the case. case. Really? I yeah, think can it's you been, elaborate on this? Uh, well, I think Phyllis Wheatley has been overrated as, as a poet, oh. and, <laughs> and so I, I just, uh, and decided not to deal with that issue. But Washington rated her pretty highly, or was he just being polite? He was just being polite. Okay, <laughs> wow, <laughs> dagger to the heart. <laughs> Won't tell some of our, uh, our authors who have really. Um... I'm not good with post 18th century technology. Um, okay, so can you talk about, um, you know, one of the things that's a great mystery about George Washington is his early years. Is the sound okay now? Or have I, okay, uh, good. Um, so one of the things that's a great mystery about Washington um, has always been his early years. There's so um, little documentation of that period in his life and his relationship with his parents. He said almost nothing about his father who died when he was very young. But you do so much with the books that you found and, and the first signature of Washington that's known that's on the title page of a, of a book. And it's almost like you found this previously, not totally unknown to biographers, but, but kind of hidden or underappreciated source on his early life. And can you talk about the life that it sheds on his childhood? Yeah. Um, it's my general opinion that that biographers w rush through childhood years too quickly. And, in you know, general I, with biographies. Yeah, I mean, I did the same thing in my Jefferson biography. I spent a lot of time in, on Jefferson's childhood. I mean, I think that uh, most of our ideas are formed before we're 10 years old. I think our, you know, for many of us, our personalities were, were already formed by the time we were 10 years old. And so I, I don't think we should rush past the childhood years in, in writing a biography. Uh, but the challenge is where, where do you find the information? I mean, how do you verify these things? Because especially Washington, I mean, there's a lot of gaps in his childhood. We don't even know exactly for sure where he uh, studied or if he went to school. Now, there's, there's some brief evidence that he, he attended school for a while. Uh, now, most of his schooling was through a domestic tutor, a, a tutor who would be hired to live in and, and, and teach him that way. Um, and so I used his books uh, to talk about you know, what books that he read when he was a kid. Now, Washington's signature changed a couple different times in his life. And so you can identify which books he had when he was young, like uh, 
and from, from his youth till his mid-teens, and then when he was in late teens, early 20s, his signature changed. And then when he was an adult, his signature was pretty consistent, so you can't really use the signature to determine when he, when he acquired these books. But for the early years, which is for my first two or three chapters, I was able to identify, through the use of his, his uh, autograph on the, on the title page, approximately when he read those books. Now, when I wrote my book, what I tried to do was to make it I mean, I wanted to make it like a biography and so that it's chronological, but yet I also wanted to give it more structure. And so I made it, I gave it kind of a double organizational scheme. I made it chronological, uh, but then I also devoted different chapters to uh, different types of books. And so the first chapter, I mean, when I first started writing this book, I didn't plan to write about religious books in the first chapter, but that's just the way that it turned out. M many of the books that George Washington, the earliest books he required were religious books. Uh, now, I don't know that they made him more devout, but, but if you look at some consistencies between these books, they all emphasized meditation as a, as a devotional practice. And I think that the meditation uh, and the idea of meditation that he learned uh, through these religious uh, books and these devotional manuals was something that he carried over to other parts of his life. And he would med meditate on... Uh, every time he, he faced a tough decision on the battlefield or, or in, uh, as president. He might have been a Buddhist today, in other words. <laughs> well, I, I, do have to, I do have to share, um, it's kind of amazing. I, I like some of the illustrations in your book of these books. So this is a, a book that Washington, um, the first book that we know that he owned, which is I think 1741, he was nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's reading this, this book, and you probably can't read the whole title page because it's a very long title. The sufficiency of a standing revelation in general and of the scriptural revelation in particular, both as to the matter of it and the proof of it, and it goes on for about another 13 lines. Um, so this is not exactly Harry Potter, is it? I mean, it's pretty heavy stuff. And, and it's, as you say, it's, it's a religious tract. Um, so, I mean, does that tell us that George was this sort of young intellectual prodigy and, and also um, do we learn something about the development of Washington's attitude towards religion over the course of his life? Because, of course, he kind of famously was maybe, maybe deist, maybe not deist, but certainly not a traditional Christian um, towards in the latter part of his life. Well, now that book, as it turns out, was very badly printed. And so it had a lot of typos in it, which he corrected. <laughs> at the age of nine. <laughs> wow. And so that tells me that he read it. Now, I don't think that he read it at nine. Yeah, but I think that he, um, I mean, I think he got snookered. I think there was a, a neighbor of his who had a copy of it and said, "Hey, I'll trade you this book." And then Washington uh, got this book and, "Oh, what is this?" Uh, <laughs> did he think he was getting a copy of Playboy or something like well, that? Well, I, I don't know, but um, he, it should have been a clue when he saw the name of the author. The author's name was Doctor Offspring Blackle. Offspring. <laughs> who names their kid Offspring? <laughs> But uh, it's, you know, if you look at George Washington's marginalia in it, you know, the, where, the, where he corrected the typos, I mean, it tells me that you know, he, he got this book when he was nine, was intimidated by it, but he didn't throw it away, he didn't get rid of it. I mean, books still had value. I mean, the, it was, even if he didn't read it, you could put it up on your shelf and it'd look good. Um, but then he, but he didn't just do that, because he went back to it, as the typos suggest, maybe when he was 15. Now, I don't oh, know. still. Uh, well, still, but I mean, this was this book was one of the Boyle lectures, and and Franklin read the Boyle lectures at, at Oxford. Um, I don't know where they were. Okay, uh, but uh, but uh, fancy you know, they were, they fancy were, British lectures. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, endowed by the the, the divine and, and, and scientist uh, Robert Boyle. Um, so, anyways, uh, Franklin read the Boyle lectures when he was fifteen, and so I said, well, Franklin did it, then Washington could have done it. Right? Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> at, at Washington College, the only answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, you know, you, you argue at, at one point, even more than argue with, you kind of refute uh, pretty convincingly Ron um, Chernow, who said that Washington's mother was basically illiterate. And can you talk about her and, and what you revealed about, about her? She's, of course, a very controversial figure. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I was kind of surprised when I read that in, in Chernow. Um, because, I mean, there's books that, that survive with her uh, uh, autograph in it. And w Washington's mother also had developed this, this meditative practice. And there's one anecdote where she would uh, go out to this rock that was overlooking the, the Potomac River, and, and, and that was her place to meditate. And so um, she had 
uh, developed this habit of meditation, which, which George uh, acquired, uh, well, well, partly through his reading and partly through his mother. And there were other books, th th there were a few books that, that she, uh, she acquired, and then, then he got, he, they ended up in his possession. And so there's a, a few books that have both her signature in it and his signature in it. And so, uh, yeah, I think that in terms of um, reading habits, uh, George Washington's mother was a, a big influence on him. You know, I, I got this impression um, of George Washington in those early years. The northern neck of Virginia was a pretty isolated place, maybe even as much as Kent County, Maryland was um, in those days. And there um, wasn't a lot of necessarily access to the rest of the world, especially for a young kid. And I almost got this idea of, of young George as like some teenager in Oklahoma today who, uh, who, you know, in rural Oklahoma, not at Central Oklahoma University, of course, but some kid in, in a rural area who, for whom the internet is this kind of um, window into the outside world. And I got the sense that, like, when Washington is going to Lord Fairfax's library and looking at the Westminster magazine, that that is this kind of portal for this hungry young man to, to engage with the world. Is that, is that fair? And can you talk about that, that role that it played for him trying to connect? Yeah, I think that, uh, boy, I don't know about comparisons with the internet, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one big difference was, is that um, and, and when you're looking at the internet, you're, you're kind of a loner. But when you're, uh -huh. when you're reading a book, or when you're when we're part of the book culture in colonial America, is that you were part of a, a community. I mean, yeah. you, were, you, you, know, you had a small collection of books yourself, but then your neighbors, neighbors had books. And you, you traded books, or you borrowed books from one another. And so there was, there was a much more, even, even more for kids, I think, a more shared community of reading. And that was, that was how people expanded their, uh, their reading habits. I mentioned earlier George Washington's knowledge of Mandeville's uh, Fable of the Bees. Uh, he didn't own a copy, but maybe he borrowed it from a neighbor. Uh, and there's a couple books when he inventoried his library. That, well, there was one book, his, his neighbor's, uh, Fairfax's copy of, of uh, Leyburn's uh, Surveying, which Washington kind of kept for a long time <laughs> after, after he borrowed it. And, and, so, uh, and, and so there's evidence that Washington was borrowing books from his neighbors as well. Now, uh, people don't normally think of George Washington as an author. But he really burst um, onto even the, the world stage as an author at the age of 21, didn't he? I mean, it's, publishing his first big work at, at 21 it took me until I was 40. I don't know how long it took you. <laughs> um, it, and I didn't even com command any military expeditions. But um, can you talk about, about that, that work and then his, his uh, work shortly after that and, and what they meant to his life and career? Yeah, I mean, I call the book George Washington a life in books because I'm looking at Washington not just as a book owner and a, and a reader, but also as a writer. The books in, uh, so the books in George Washington's life include the books that he, he wrote as well. Now, um, when, he, when Governor Dinwiddie first sent him out in, into the wilderness to deliver the, this message to the French, uh, George Washington kept a diary of it. 1753? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, when he, he got back to Williamsburg and he, he gave the diary to Governor Dinwiddie and, and Dinwiddie thought, well, you know, this is really good. We've got to publish this and, and, and circulate it more, uh, get the word out. Um, and so Washington, you know, he had a couple days to revise it, but he, he didn't change it very much. Uh, but then published, published this travel narrative, which I think is, is really one of the uh, great travel uh, works of, of early American literature, and it's never really been recognized as, as such, and it, it am amazes me that it hasn't. Yeah, you use the phrase exquisite lyricism, which just, wow, you don't think of George Washington as being <laughs> lyrical, but you really feel that's the case. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful writing, I think. Wow. And I, I was also, I was really interested to read um, some, of the, uh, some of the reviews of that, of that book. Um, so, I mean, just these kind of rave blurb reviews. One of them says, we cannot oblige our readers at this juncture with anything more entertaining than George Washington's journal to Ohio. Another person commented, the manliness of his style it renders a very interesting performance. He was even manly when he sat down and wrote. What a manly <laughs> man our George certainly was. But then uh, George III didn't think as highly of it when he read it, did he? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> 
Yeah, can you tell us about that? And it's kind of funny to think that, that George III was aware of this guy when he was 21 years old through his, through his writing. Now, are you, are you thinking, are you, I don't, are you thinking of this, this, this episode or the, there was a later episode after the... Oh, maybe it was his second. Yeah, uh, yeah it, was his, it was his second. It was about the uh, Braddock expedition. Uh -huh. yeah, that's the, yeah, can and, you talk about that, about that work? Well, uh, uh, Washington's first, uh, first firefight uh, uh, at the start of the, the French Indian, Indian War. I mean, he made the comment like, oh, the, uh, I love the sound of the bu bullets whizzing past, uh, past me. Or, or, I forget the exact wording. Uh, and then George... Uh, Something said, charming. Said that, yeah. He was charming. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, uh, he wouldn't say that if, if, he, had, if he had heard more, uh, more bullets. I forget the exact, but something like that. And Washington himself, later on, uh, somebody asked him, did you really say that about the huh. bullets whizzing past, how, how charming a sound the bullets whizzing past your head was? And uh, Washington replied, well, if I said that, I, I was much younger then. Uh, <laughs> this was during the Revolution, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And I mean, everyone knew that because that somebody got a hold of a copy of that letter, and it was published in the London Magazine, and so that's how how the, the king read it. And everyone, I mean, everyone remembered that that saying. You know, you also you sort of um, refute a slander against Washington College in this book. Um, you may not have known that you were doing it, but a slander against specifically our, our first president, Reverend Dr. William Smith of Sainted Memory. Um, however, I have often heard it said, whispered around Chestertown, that William Smith was actually a Tory. Um, now, you actually talk about William Smith's work that he published right before the revolution that was pretty radical, pretty close to pushing for independence and may have influenced Washington to, to make Washington even a little bit more radical, right? Yeah, it, uh, William Smith's sermon uh, was one of many uh, political sermons that Washington had in his library. And, I mean, we're, from, uh, for all the preachers, I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, you can't really tell people from the pulpit, especially from the pulpit of the Church of England, to rebel against England. Uh, and, and so um, the preachers, even the preachers who were uh, Church of England uh, Reverends in the Church of England sympathized with the revolutionaries, but they couldn't quite uh, say so from the pulpit. Uh, and, and so they tried to shape their argument uh, in, in a way that, that it, uh, they supported the revolution, but that they, they didn't want to go them, them to go too far. And so there's, there's a lot of consistency in all those political sermons of that time period. So it may be that when Smith wrote to Washington a few years later, uh, telling him about this new college and asking him to lend his name to it, that Washington was remembering this pamphlet and thinking, oh, well, if it's this guy's idea, it, may, it must be a good idea. Maybe. maybe, okay, maybe. <laughs> I, I was interested that you, you talk about, you know, speaking of people writing to Washington about naming things after him, there were so many people after the revolution who wanted to dedicate their books to Washington. Washington almost always said no. Yeah. And why was that? Well, because he was uh, humble. Okay. Um, and I mean, some several people did did it without his permission. Right. Uh, they, uh, but um, when he asked uh, people, asked authors, asked him to dedicate, it, he said he would say no. And then there's one guy who, uh, Washington was disappointed that the guy didn't ask him to subscribe to it. Right. And, uh, he would have rather have been a subscriber than, than to, been, to have been the dedicatee. Uh, it's interesting, Washington really did uh, encourage uh, people to um, support, the, support literature, support the arts, and some, Washington himself subscribed to many, many books, not, not all that he intended to read, but ones, books that he subscribed to just to support literature, to support writing in the new country. And that may also relate to his, I don't want to always bring it back to Washington College, but he, he was a great believer that um, arts and, and literature had to be an essential part of this new republic, didn't he? And, and there was a, a quote from, Washington Smith, from uh, William Smith in here that I really love. Uh, I just have to briefly give an excerpt of. So he's writing in 1775, and William Smith says, if we cultivate the spirit of liberty among our children, if we guard against the snares of luxury, venality, and corruption, the genius of America will still rise triumphant. This country will be free, nay, for ages to come, a chosen seat of freedom, arts, and heavenly knowledge. Uh, 
So, wow, you just imagine him sort of smiling down on Washington College today, <laughs> cultivating the spirit of liberty among our children. I don't know how well we're doing with the luxury and venality part. <laughs> Patrice, do you have any comment on, on that, <laughs> Provost de Quincio? Um, anyway, uh, that was just, uh, it, was, it was fun and, and exciting to find. So, um, okay, I guess we're getting to the point where uh, we might want to take some, some questions um, from uh, the rest of the folks here. So maybe starting with a Washington College student. <laughs> Would any of our students in the audience like to ask a question? Yes. Well, uh, Washington's library has been cataloged a couple different times. Washington himself cataloged uh, the library, but then at the end of his life, it was cataloged, and so. In the 19th century, the library was dispersed, and so the books that survive, survive in several different libraries. Now, the Boston Athenaeum has the largest collection of Washington books, but then, uh, and then uh, Mount Vernon has a good uh, sized collection of them, and then Library Company of Philadelphia, Princeton University, uh, New York Public Library, Indiana University, they all have uh, books that survive from Washington's library. So it's just a lot of footwork, you, you going around from one library to the next and, and looking at these books. You were talking last night about how Washington's books, or, or the largest collection of them, ended up in Boston of all places when you think they should be in Virginia. And um, <laughs> can you tell, the story is really interesting, maybe people want to hear that. Yeah, I mean, that there was a, a 19th century bookseller named Henry Stevens, and he had an agreement with the British Museum uh, to fill up their collection of Americana and, and uh, what he decided to do, I'm going to buy Washington's library and sell that to the British Museum. And you know, when the, there was some Boston men who were uh, very upset about that, oh, how can we do that? <laughs> sell Washington's library to his old enemy? No. <laughs> and so they got together a subscription fund to buy Washington's library, the books that survived from it. Many of them had already been dispersed by this point. And so they got enough money together that they subscribed to this, to this fund and then bought the Washington uh, library books. And uh, so that's why the largest collection of uh, library books survives at the Boston Athenaeum. It's about over 400 or so books that survived there. Almost half the books that he owned at his, at his death are there in, in Boston. Yeah, a little bit less, but yeah, about that. Um, any other student questions? OK, students of all ages. <laughs> David. Well, he did keep a diary of what went on during the convention, but um, it doesn't say anything about the convention. It just says where he went to eat and, and uh, like that. Now, I mean, there was a, they took a, a vow of secrecy. And so, I mean, it's understandable why he wouldn't be writing about it, because they weren't supposed to reveal anything about what, the proceedings that went on in the Constitutional Convention uh, to anyone else. And so, you know, that's understandable. And you just, you just wish that they, <laughs> I mean, I understand why they did it, but Man, I, I, I'd like some anecdotes uh, from what went on in that room. Uh, that's really something that's lost to history. Uh, but it, it's my impression that Washington uh, acted as a leader. Uh, I mean, he, he let other people do, do all the debating and all the arguing, and he just uh, was the, the kind of stabilizing presence. And that's the, the impression I've always gotten from that. Now, one of the things that survives in Washington's papers is a, uh, a set of notes uh, about governing and good governance that Washington got from James Madison. Now, in Washington's, in, in Madison's copy, and this is something that Madison himself compiled, you know, it's got uh, all these Latin footnotes in it and stuff. In Washington's copy, it doesn't have any of the footnotes in it, so it's like the, uh, the popular version of, of <laughs> Madison's without, without the notes uh, and without the Latin erudition. Um, but it's, it showed, to me, it shows that Washington was, was very interested in, in uh, what Madison was thinking and, and writing about, and, and, and ha that helped him in the Constitutional Convention. 
Yeah, David's question also reminds me that in your book you talk about all the people who were saying to Washington after the war, General Washington, you have to write a history of the war, just like Julius Caesar wrote his commentaries on the, on the Gallic Wars, and um, why, why didn't Washington do that? And, and what was his, his attitude toward the way that the war would, would be remembered and, and told in books? Well, he looked forward to seeing what, how it would be told. But when, when people told him, oh, you've you, you got to be the one to write it, and he just, uh, <laughs> I mean, a, a really interesting comment from an anecdote I found that he, he told one guy that, um, you know, I've, I've seen too much of the horrors of war to, to, to want to recall it. Mm. And so it's a very, a very moving comment. Do not have any of his books here at Washington College. I don't. If, I don't know if, if you want to answer that question or if it's. Yeah, we do have a copy of um, a narrative of Washington College from 1784 that William Smith wrote, and we know that Smith sent a copy of that to George Washington, um, and that that copy actually went with his books to the Boston Athenaeum, where it was inscribed by Washington on the title page, inscribed by Smith to Washington, signed with Washington's own autograph. About 10 years ago, I was at the Boston Athenaeum, and I asked the director if I could see this book, and I thought how cool it would be to have a facsimile made for Washington College. And the director asked um, the library staff to retrieve it, and they went off, and they didn't come back, and I saw some people kind of in the back, like, buzzing, talking nervously, and they finally came out, and they said, we can't find the book. I said, you can't find the book? And they said, no, and I said, well, it's here in your catalog, and they said, yeah, but that catalog is from the 80s, and when we did some renovations on the building in like the early 90s, some of our books went missing. So it's just heartbreaking. So I have an eBay alert in case that book comes up <laughs> for sale. Seriously, though, it's, it's incredibly uh, sad, and, and I hope that in the way that things sometimes turn up, that that will turn up eventually. Wendy? Yeah, but he didn't write that. I mean, he, he copied it out from, from I, I'm, what, I, what I theorized that he got it from his tutor. So this is something that, that circulated in, uh, I mean, there were printed versions of it, but Washington's version doesn't quite match any of the print, printed versions. And so this is something that circulated from teacher to student to uh, student uh, like that. But yeah, it was in his teens when he first wrote that. All that stuff about not spitting and scratching yourself and breaking wind and all that is not actually Washington's. Uh, Presumably, he followed those precepts. Uh, I, uh, Janet, you had a question. Uh, someone recently asked me about whether or not it was true that the founding fathers looked to the Persian emperor Cyrus's great, uh, great cylinder as some sort of early model of religious liberty. Have you ever heard of that before? It's the first I'd ever heard of it. You know what I'm talking about? The Cyrus cylinder. Uh, it's 6th century BCE. Cyrus the Great was used. People have been captured by the Babylonians and allowed them to go home and keep eating the food, but in order to be able to go back and rebuild their temples. And so this person was suggesting that the founding fathers looked to the Cyrus cylinder as some sort of model of religious liberty. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the, the way to start looking for that would be to see where it was first published, or what, was it available in the 18th century, and, and how, how well known was it in the 18th century, and um, you know, to find out what books had it or, or published it, and then start looking through library catalogs of, of Adams and, and Jefferson and other founding fathers to see if it was in their libraries. Is there any evidence that Washington was interested in non-Western cultures? I mean, Jefferson was, and he had a Quran, but is there any evidence at all with Washington? There was, um, there was this one guy in early America, and I had a, a big section of him in there, and I realized it was way, way too much to include in the book, but he, he wrote a book about India, and he was looking for subscribers and ended up recruiting 1, 000, over 1,000 subscribers in early America to... Uh, including Washington and, and Adams and, and Hamilton, uh, to, to, who subscribed to this book about India. That Hindustan thing? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there were uh, some interest okay. in, in other cultures. Uh, yeah, do I have any more uh, students? Yes, Caroline. <laughs> 
Um, well, it's interesting to, to kind of line up the events in his life in a timeline and then to line up his purchases because before the Revolutionary War, Washington ordered some book plates for his, his books and he ordered about 500 of them. But at that time, he only had you know, less than 200 books in his library. So that tells me that before the Revolutionary War, Washington was about to, to make a big, you know, lots of books of book purchases. And, but it's the intervention of the war uh, that really stopped him from acquiring a lot of books. Uh, and mainly ma military manuals and, and practical books for the war is what he, he acquired during the war. And then once the war was over with, then he started buying more books in, in a, a, of a general nature. And so that's a, that's a good question. It really, it's, uh, you, can, you can learn a lot by you lining up the timeline of his life and then lining up the timeline of his, his acquisition of books and, and to see what the correlation is. So I'll have questions over on this side. You're talking about the Scotch Enlightenment for those who might not hear it over here, and Adam Smith and Hutchinson and others. Well, he had Adam Smith's great treatise of, of uh, economy, and that book survives at Princeton University. And guess what? It's got Washington's typo corrections in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he did read uh, Adam Smith. Uh, I don't know how he got through it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Was it an influence? I'm not sure how much of an influence it, it was on him, but I mean, I, just by looking at the, those, those typo corrections, I could tell that he, he had read it. If you had to pick out a book that was the most influential, what would it be? Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I can't. I can't okay, think. We'll, we'll talk about it over okay. cocktails. Like okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, Pat. Uh, thanks for a wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm wondering, kind of, what did you expect to find when you set out on this kind of journey, and what were some of the biggest surprises along the way that, that you kind of weren't, weren't expecting to find at all? Well, I, I hope to find uh, enough information to write a book about. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was successful in, in that respect. Uh, one thing that I, you know, I just recently I was asked to write an, uh, an article about Washington for the, the Mount Vernon magazine. And so uh, they, they told me I could pick whatever subject I wanted to pick. And so I, wanted, I decided I'll just pick something that's in the book so I can just kind of uh, extract a little bit of a chapter and then uh, it'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually I did, did some more original work for this article, and I decided to write about George Washington and Don Quixote, how George Washington read Don Quixote. And I found some, some new information still, I mean, and so I'm, uh, that's not in, uh, not in this book, and so I'm still finding new stuff. And, and so there's, uh, there's always more stuff to find out there, and I think that that's, it doesn't quite answer your question exactly, but I mean, it, it tells me that, uh, well, I'll just repeat something that my teacher, uh, at Delaware told me, Herschel Parker, he said, all you have to do is, is put out your hand and stuff will drop into it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really true. I mean, if uh, you go looking for something, you're, you're going to find it. No matter, you know, may not be what you were planning to find, but you're going to find something as, lo as long as you look. Maybe we have time for, uh, for two more questions. Am I missing anyone on this side? Yeah, right. of the well, this guy's going to raise his hand every time. Yes, yes, sir. Considering his political role, uh, what about uh, the 18th century classics in, uh, in politics like uh, Rousseau's A Social Contract or uh, 
prosecute spirited laws. And finally, I've also seen many references to Washington loving the theater. Uh, and that he was very, uh, very fond of Addison. But considering that uh, one of the most outspoken friends of America uh, and opponents of, of British policies in the House of, po uh, houses of, Common, uh, House of Commons is Richard Brinsley Sheriff. Uh, did he have copies of uh, the rivals or the school for scandal? Okay, that's three questions. <laughs> Maybe you can give quick <laughs> answers to each of them. Okay. Um, well, as far as dancing goes, I, uh, Washington, in his library, at least the books that survive, uh, didn't have anything about dancing. Uh, but Martha Washington did. I mean, she had a manuscript uh, book of music, and, which, which contained some dance tunes in there. And so I was so happy when I learned about that, because then I was able to put Martha and George dancing together in, in Mount Vernon. So it very, pleased me very much to be able to put that in, in my book. Um, there's no Montesquieu in Washington's library that I know of. Uh, Patrick Henry read Montesquieu. Uh, but that's another book that I wrote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when you finish the Washington, then you go out and buy my Patrick Henry book. Um, now, as far as the, the playwrights go, now, as it turns out, I'm writing a new book about uh, Shakespeare. And my, my title for my new book is called uh, Shakespeare and the Making of America. And so I talk about, and this is something I talk about in here too, George Washington's references to Shakespeare, because there's uh, three that I found for this book. I mean, there's a reference to The Tempest, there's a reference to Twelfth Night, I think, and then the Henry V. The, uh, Henry the uh, Washington was a, was a great theater goer. He saw Hamlet in 1773 in New York, and then he also, during the Constitutional Convention, he saw a performance of The Tempest, and, and so, um, you know, a great Shakespeare enthusiast, uh, Washington was. And Washington saw a play right here on our campus, and uh, William Smith, who may not have been the most impartial source, wrote that tears were rolling down Washington's cheeks as he watched our students declaiming <laughs> their soliloquies. I don't know about, I don't know about that. Sorry? What was the play? Uh, that was um, Addison's Cato, I think. Um, is, is that right? It was Cato? Was well, I know Cato. he saw Cato at Valley Forge. Yeah, I think, it was, I think they knew that Cato was, was one of his favorite plays, and so they did it, but they adapted some of the soliloquies so that they would be about Washington. That was supposedly when he, when he cried. I think we have time for one more question, and Paul mixes the best cocktails in Chestertown, so he gets it in the back <laughs> row. Okay. Um, it wasn't important to him in, in the way that it was important to uh, Jefferson. Now, through my research, what I discovered, now, when, when Washington got married, uh, then he was able to bring the uh, books of Martha's uh, husband um, to Mount Vernon. Now, those books were, uh, now, Daniel, Daniel Park Custis, with, that was Martha's first husband's name, uh, he was not much of a bookman, but his, his father, John Custis, was. And so Washington went to John Custis's home in Williamsburg, where all the books were uh, located, and Washington cataloged those books as they stood on the shelves. And then he, he left, he, and then he packed them up as they were shelved, and then brought them to uh, Mount Vernon. And then Washington, his own library was very small at that time, so he used Custis's organizational scheme, and then filed his own books in, in with Custis's scheme. Now, Custis didn't have much of a scheme, but you can see certain patterns, like medical, there were some medical books that were shelved together. Uh, Milton's poetry was in one place, but Milton's prose was in another place. And so you can kind of discern some, uh, some kind of organizational scheme. And so it's my theory that Custis had this scheme that, you know, it, it was pretty organized when he, at first, but then he kind of got lackadaisical about it, and, and the, his, his, his scheme got messed up, but Washington didn't care that much about it. I mean, Washington did, you know, kind of cluster some books together, but he never had a, a systematic way of organizing his books. It's not like uh, Jefferson, where you go to the Library of Congress, and it's like you're in a scale model of Jefferson's brain right. there in, in the Jefferson <laughs> building. It's great. Well, I know there are some more questions, um, but uh, 
uh, Kevin Hayes will be here to sign books, and there will be a chance for um, those of you to um, talk to him afterwards. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Kevin.